as far as the east is from the west, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Welcome back to Why Hope, the video series that explores reasons for hope in our day. This is season eight, where we are exploring the way that God meets us in our need. And here in episode four, we are going to explore the idea that God meets us at our, in our guilt. So I want to start, um, maybe, I mean, where do, you, where do you go? Where do you go here to talk about God's forgiveness? It's, going to, it's, it's woven through scripture. And if I were going to try and take you on a, anything like um, a complete tour of that theme, well, this video would not be 10 minutes, it'd be 10 hours long. So I'm going to show you just a few samples, maybe one or two things that you, you haven't uh, looked at recently. So I want to begin um, in Genesis 15. Now, in Genesis, um, as we have touched on a few times, um, God calls Abraham um, and through through Abraham and through the family that comes from Abraham, God is going to is, is, is starting this great project of saving the world. Um, and he makes a binding covenant with Abraham, which then it kind of gets um, um, deepened and, and, and enriched in the covenant of Sinai, which we've spoke about a number of times. But in the ancient world, when two people made a covenant, um, they both had to agree that to keep it, you know, its stipulations. That's, that's the nature of a covenant, really. And what they would do, whereas you or I might sign on the dotted line and date it and get witnesses, perhaps, what they would do is they would take some animals and sacrifice them. They would cut those animals in half and separate them and then would walk down between those animals. And that was a kind of, that was a way, it was a, it was a ritual for, for solemnising that covenant. And it was also saying, um, if I do not uphold this covenant, then may, you know, may what has happened to these animals happen to me. So that's how you would make a covenant in the ancient world. Two people, two men probably would get together, they'd, you know, agree the deal of it. Then they'd go through this ritual and together they would walk down through the cut pieces of the animals. Now, in Genesis, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And at one point, because um, he makes it kind of, he states it a few times, makes it a few times. And at one point, um, we see a ritual rather like the one I just described to you. And this is in Genesis 15. When the sun had gone dark, down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. Sorry, I missed it. I missed a bit out. A bit that basically says that on God's instructions, Abraham took some, some animals and birds and cut them in half in the way that we've just described. And when the sun had gone down, Abraham looks and he sees a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passing between these pieces. Now, this um, this fire is a uh, a way. It's, it's a kind of vision of God. It's a representation of the presence of God. We see um, fire functioning in that way in a number of places in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So compare what I've just read to you with what I just told you about how a covenant was made. And here we notice that it is only God who passes between the parts of the animal. And although he doesn't spell it out here, it is as if he is saying, I alone will be able to uphold this covenant. You and your descendants are not going to be able to uphold this covenant. You're going to break it again and again, but I will uphold it. And in rather the way that, as those human participants, when they went down, were saying, in the brief, may, if this covenant is broken, may it be to me as has happened to these animals. I think here we get a glimpse, we get a hint that God may be saying, and if the covenant is broken, it will be to me as it was to these animals. Now, we're talking about guilt here, and that, but that's just setting the scene for what we discover about God all the way through, which is he is... The prime actor in this. There's there's a hymn that we sing, a song, that, a modern worship song that we sing, which I, I kind of like, except that it speaks at the beginning um, about, you know, I was separated from God and I cry out and then he came to my aid. And, and although that is often how it feels, um, actually God is the first mover. God is the prime actor. He is the one who, who, um, who initiates uh, reconciliation. He is the one who reaches out towards the guilty party and if we in our desperation and our guilt cry out towards God that is actually only because he has first reached out towards us and stirred our hearts and made us aware of our need. So we begin there in Genesis but now let's return to the psalm that we were looking at last week which is Psalm 103. 
Um, and uh, here the psalmist is quoting um, God's words of self-disclosure from the Sinai Covenant. And we spent um, an early video discussing the Sinai Covenant where God describes himself as merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And I think I said in that, that video that, that this is a refrain that runs through the Bible from here on, and especially in the Psalms. So let me read you a few verses here. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. Our guilt is too much to bear and on our own we could not solve that problem. We, but God is the prime mover and he comes towards us in our need and he meets us with love and forgiveness. I want to um, show you a verse, a chapter that reflects the um, reflects the the kind something of the heart of God in this, um, and it's from the book of Hosea. So Hosea is an exploration of sinful Israel um, before the time of Jesus and God's love and forgiveness for them. And, and of course, God hasn't changed. And so although this is set back before the time of Jesus, here we see the heart of God towards his sinful people, which is still true of, of him and of us today. So it begins by describing God's, um, his loving creation of the nation of Israel, really. And it, it likens um, Israel to, um, to, to a, a toddler that God um, um, carried in his arms and, and taught to walk and, and so on. I won't read you those verses. That's from the beginning of Hosea chapter 11. But these are a people who are living with the consequences of the breach of the covenant. So they have broken the covenant um, and, and by all justice and by all, um, by everything that God has said, really, um, they have forfeited any entitlement that they held um, with the covenant because now they have broken it. And God is basically, he's saying this in this chapter, he's saying, you know, you're going to have to pay the consequences of it. Um, and the, the ultimate consequence of breach of covenant was that they would be conquered by their enemies and they would lose the land and lose their land. And, and this is clearly going to happen. And God is talking about this in this chapter. But then the tone switches and we get this extraordinary, um, these words of compassion. Let me read to you. How can I give you up? Ephraim, how can I hand you over, O Israel? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not exercise my fierce anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. And in this beautiful chapter, I think we see something of the of the, 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 the pulls that God experiences. Uh, it's, it's amazing that we can say these things about God. But the, the demands of justice, the demands that, um, that, that, that justice say, um, you know, breach of covenant must have its consequences. God holds those in tension with his deep affection for his people, with his mercy, with his compassion towards them. And they strain apart. And here we kind of see that tension. We see the, the need for judgment and justice with this deep compassion that says, I can't bear to do this to you. This is a, square, a circle that will only be squared at the cross. There is, no, um, there is no way in the Old Testament. The Old Testament hints towards it, but does not resolve this. And it is only in the cross. And as we begin to explore and understand this, um, through the teaching of Jesus and through the teaching of the apostles that we start to see how these things can be held together. But let me read to you one more uh, um, passage, and this is from the New Testament, and this is um, the parable of the prodigal son. And I'm simply going to read this to you and then close. 
Jesus said there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the wealth that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant region and squandered his wealth in dissolent living. When he'd spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that region and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the region who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating and no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Wherever you are, whatever you have done, if you repent and turn to the Lord Jesus, there is forgiveness and there is a welcome for you. And for this reason, we can have 